Mr. Koichi Kawano, Chairman of Genseeking, Mr. Yasunari Fujimoto, Vice Chairman and today's moderator, Mr. Kevin Martin, President of Peace Action, Ms. Lee young of People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy, and fellow peace workers. It is my pleasure and honor to join you to discuss what we should be doing following the historic entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. While the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic is testing the humankind's ability to find rational means of survival collectively, one positive assurance is that TPNW went into effect yesterday. It was an epoch-making accomplishment for all of us. What I wish to emphasize before anything else is the contributions of the peace workers of the world in a broad sense that made this possible. Hibakusha of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Genseeking workers, ICAN members, staff and supporters, other NGOs, like-minded nations, experts on medicine, law, and other relevant fields, and the list goes on. I'm assuming that all of us are familiar with the substance of the treaty. So today, I'd like to focus on what we should be doing next. The main point I'd like to make is elementary. Learn from the past successes, apply them to solve current problems, and create a bright future. Because we have succeeded in making TPNW a reality, the logical conclusion is that we should keep on practicing what we have been doing so far. However, since we need to redefine our ultimate and interim goal after the success, we may also need to obtain new tools and fresh approaches to reaching them. I'm saying that uh, TPNW, although it is important, is not the ultimate goal of our efforts. We must create a peaceful world without nuclear weapons. So let us choose the abolition of nuclear weapons as our next long-term goal. Following the advice of a world-famous author, Napoleon Hill, who published the Bessel in 1937, who pointed out that a goal without a deadline is just a dream. I want to attach a deadline. It is 2040. There is a convincing historical fact suggesting that we might need 20 years to make such a monumental work a reality. As you all know, the International Court of Justice, ICJ, handed down its advisory opinion, which is also historic, that the nuclear weapons and their use are generally illegal under international law in 1996. And it took 21 years for the UN General Assembly to adopt TPNW by a majority vote. It is plausible that it would take another 20 years to reach total abolition from now. If we follow the example set by Mayors for Peace when it adopted its 2020 vision, we want to choose an interim goal. It is natural for us living in Japan to expect that the Japanese government to ratify TPNW and by 2030. For those living in other areas, there would be more suitable interim goals. Please find alternative ones. I believe it crucial for the Japanese government, together with the Hibakusha, to work with the majority of the world to persuade the nuclear weapon states to ratify TPNW. As Japan is the only A-bombed country, it has the moral authority and credence when it speaks the truth about nuclear issues. To reach our primary goal and the interim one, let us identify and adopt four ingredients essential in achieving past successes toward the world's denuclearization. One, success, reliance on the majority. Obtaining the advisory opinion from ICJ was successful because the world's peace workers under the umbrella of World Court Project relied on the majority decisions of WHO and the General Assembly. Their resolutions passed by majority votes requested ICJ for such a ruling. This approach skirted nuclear weapon states' intention to veto such a move in a consensus system they dominate. 
such as the Security Council and the NPT Review Conference. Members and supporters of WCP lobbied worldwide to convince diplomats and politicians that they should vote to obtain the ICJ's advisory opinion. TPNW success replicated the philosophy and practical scenarios that WCP employed by creating an open-ended working group, or OEWG, by the majority vote of the General Assembly. Then, OEWG went ahead to recommend the General Assembly to start negotiations toward concluding TPNW. The rest is history. The like-minded nations, NGOs such as ICANN, and experts in relevant fields were the leaders in this effort. They held numerous educational meetings to teach nuclear war's humanitarian consequences. As a result, the majority of the world became even more convinced and numerous. Second success, appealing to courts to enforce laws and treaties. National governments often disregard the law, including international law. Bringing governments to court when their behavior is unlawful or fighting governments when they unlawfully try to punish citizens for their rightful conduct always helps the majority. If we win, that's great. Even if we lose, the legal arguments presented in the court usually reach a broader audience through the media. With additional knowledge, we citizens can force the government to face the law's intent and make it to be accountable to us. For example, a case brought against three women who belong to Trident Plowshares, a peace group in Scotland, charged with criminal offenses when they took nonviolent direct civil resistance actions shows the point. They argued for the innocence by appealing to the ICJ's advisory opinion and the Nuremberg principles. The court found them not guilty. In 2014, the Republic of Marshall Islands brought the nine nuclear weapon states to ICJ, charging them with a violation of Article 6 of NPT. The article basically says that each party must participate in negotiations in good faith toward nuclear disarmament. Although ICJ dismissed the cases for the lack of jurisdiction, RMI's action received worldwide support and made the point that pacta sunt servanda, that's a Latin for agreements must be kept, is the cornerstone of the rule of law. Japanese courts played an indispensable role in correcting the government's misinterpretation of or blatant disregard of relevant laws. In the Shimoda case of 1955, the Tokyo District Court ruled that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the U.S. to be against international law. Other courts also protected the rights of Hibakusha by handing down just decisions. One. They recognized the Hibakusha Medical Act as applicable to the Hibakusha living overseas in 1978. And two, they included cataract as treatable ailment under the same law in 1976. And three, they provided a scientifically meaningful criterion as a definition of affected by radiation in 2009. Lobbying diplomats and politicians who work in the United Nations is beyond our capacity for most of us. However, a determined individual could start litigation in a local court even today. Third success, creation of nuclear weapon-free zones. Such a zone consists of countries in some geographical region that ratify a treaty promising to have no nuclear weapons on their soils. Ideally, nuclear weapon states also promise not to attack this group with their nuclear weapons. Please look at the world map showing these zones. It is noteworthy that the entire southern hemisphere is nuclear weapon free. All we need now is to expand such zones to cover the whole Northern Hemisphere. Success 4. Cities and mayors as building blocks of peace. 
Scotland held a referendum in 2014 to decide whether it should gain the status of an independent state or not. If it becomes independent, it refuses to possess nuclear weapons or to become a NATO member. Of course, it becomes a member of the EU. This direction is all but natural. All the municipalities in Scotland had already declared themselves nuclear weapon free. The cities of the world are one in their attitude toward war. Since cities suffer from war and tragedies and atrocities they bring, they declare in unison never again. The Hibakusha of Hiroshima and Nagasaki echo the same sentiment by announcing no one else should suffer as we did. That is why cities and mayors decided to become members of the organization Mayors for Peace and participate in its 2020 vision campaign. Since cities do not own the military, they can go beyond who did what to whom first and therefore who is to blame. As a result, a broader coalition aiming at and focusing on disarmament on all levels becomes easier. Now let me list the candidate next steps to success. First candidate, create the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Dr. Hiromichi Umebayashi and Peace Depot have long advocated the idea. Hiroshima and Nagasaki and other endorsers are too numerous to mention. The six parties of this idea are the three core countries Japan, the Democratic Re People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, and the Republic of Korea, ROK, and the three outer countries, China, Russia, and the USA. The three core countries agreed to stay nuclear weapon free or become so, and the outer three countries guarantee that they would not attack the core countries with their nuclear weapons. Japan and ROK do not possess nuclear weapons. China has adhered to the non-first use policy for some time. DPRK must renounce its nuclear arsenals, and both Russia and USA must guarantee not to attack the core countries. For Russia and the US, a non-first use policy is more comfortable to swallow than giving up their nuclear weapons outright. DPRK must make the toughest concession but the six-country agreement would also assure its continued existence in the international framework. Second candidate. Citizens take initiatives to learn from those countries that already ratified TPNW. Invite ambassadors stationed in your country to your city to give lectures on how his or her country has successfully ratified the treaty. Together with the mayor and the city council, citizens can offer a certificate appreciation that will solidify the relations between your city and the country he or she represents. Make such an occasion a launching pad for creating the city resolution or ordinance that would support and promote TPNW. If your city already has done this, strengthen it by a second similar action. Third candidate work with children so that they would ask straightforward and logical questions of adults. The human race lacks both a good enough lexicon to describe the atrocities and illegality of nuclear weapons and sufficient imagination to fill the gap. That is a theme I developed in the 2004 Peace Declaration. Now that TPNW is a persuasive and definitive addition to the lexicon, the implication is not limited to legal spheres. TPNW reflects the genuine desires for peace we typically observe in children, and children are capable of expressing themselves logically, straightforwardly, and passionately. Let us work with them to compress the expressions in book forms, art forms, musical creations that would affect adults who would not otherwise budge. The fourth candidate, round up the usual suspects. When we citizens and peace workers tackle a problem, there are standard action menus that we have been using for many years. Let us pull them out of our drawers and use them. Signature 
marketing campaigns, having the city council pass resolutions and ordinances, marching on streets, holding teachings and other meetings, and the list goes on. Also, let us add Michael Moore's 10-point action plan to our medicine cabinet. I leave it to you as homework to develop a plausible scenario that would attract new activists to our efforts. A good starting point may be creating the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Establishing other regional nuclear weapon free zones in the Northern Hemisphere might be a worthwhile next step. I sincerely hope that this symposium begins a productive, constructive, sustained series of actions and results that would lead to the total abolition of nuclear weapons. Thank you for your attention.